Hello and welcome to the Geographic Calculator webinar for the month of July. Currently all attendees are in listen-only mode and you should be able to see our first slide on the screen. I'm Jasmine Bird, an application specialist here at Blue Marble Geographics, and I'm here with Sam Knight, the Director of Product Management. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can use the questions tool on the GoToWebinar panel to the right of your screen. We will try to answer your questions as they are submitted, and Sam will address any outstanding questions at the end of the presentation. And as always, you can contact us at geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com for further questions after the session. We have some upcoming events as well that Sam will talk about. At this point, I'm going to hand off to Sam Knight, Director of Product Management. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jasmine, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today, uh, we're going to kick off part one of a two-part uh, section uh, of uh, joining Global Mapper and Blue Marble uh, Geographic Calculator together. Um, before we actually get rolling, I just want to quick mention uh, some upcoming events that we uh, have uh, coming up in September and in October. Uh, annually, we uh, do a Blue Marble user conference, and uh, this year we, we're actually doing two in uh, two different locations. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, conferences in uh, Calgary, uh, up in Canada, and down in Houston, Texas. Uh, the first uh, in Calgary is going to be on uh, Monday, September 8th. Um, that's going to be at the, the Delta Bow Valley Hotel uh, up in uh, uh, Calgary, Alberta. And uh, in conjunction with that, we're going to be doing uh, global mapper training. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested in either attending uh, the conference or uh, signing up for some training that's going to be happening around that uh, event, uh, please uh, see the event uh, website. And the, the address for that is right at the, the top of the screen there, bluemarblegeo.com slash BMUC. And uh, a little more than a month later, uh, down in Houston, Texas, we're going to be doing another one. So uh, on uh, Thursday, October 30th, uh, at the Royal Sinesta Hotel, um, that's right down by the by the Galleria for those of you in Houston, uh, we're going to be doing another session. Uh, we're going to be having uh, full uh, full suites of uh, speakers, uh, user presentations, uh, talking about all different types of user applications uh, and how how folks are working with uh, all of our tools. Uh, so Global Mapper. Uh, Geographic Calculator uh, 2014, uh, the, the GeoCalc SDKs, and the Global Mapper SDKs as well. Um, so there's going to be a lot of content, um, and uh, there's going to be various things like door prizes, uh, chances to win free licenses uh, of our, our software, and, and so on. So uh, check out the website. Uh, should be uh, should be a pretty good time. Um, so. Now what we're going to do is hop right into uh, the Geographic Calculator today. Uh, so I mentioned this is going to be a two-part session. So uh, today's webinar we're going to be focusing on the Geographic Calculator side of the operation. And uh, in a week from today uh, we're going to be uh, following this up with how all of the, the admin tools that we're going to be looking at today actually get used in the, the Global Mapper side of the, of the pair. Uh, so today's topic, we're going to be focusing on uh, specifically the administrative uh, functions in Calculator, uh, how we can uh, maintain, manage, uh, guide our users, uh, restrict our users from, from making uh, various decisions uh, in the Geographic Calculator, how we can control all of those uh, conversion uh, tools and utilities that are going to be used uh, over in Global Mapper. Um, so I imagine we have a, a number of folks here today who are probably new to the, the geographic calculator um, as a thing. I'm just going to bring up one, one more slide here. Uh, to talk about what we're going to be seeing in the calculator itself. Uh, we are going to be working purely in uh, Geographic Calculator 2014 today. Uh, if there are users uh, who are still using uh, Geographic Calculator 2013, that will also link up uh, to uh, version 14 of Global Mapper, the, the last year's release of, of Global Mapper. We'll talk about that again a little bit later. Uh, the data uh, today that we're going to be working with is essentially the, the workspaces themselves uh, in Calculator. So uh, really we're going to be talking about the infrastructure of the application itself rather than specific data files. Uh, what we're going to get into next week is actually using the data uh, within the context of all of these administrative controls. So the, the places we're going to be working in the calculator today 
we're going to take a look at uh, the project manager, how that is uh, set up and, and controlled uh, within the context of these admin tools. We're going to take a look at the administrative tools themselves, uh, so how we actually control how people work in uh, the project manager on the calculator side. Um, next week, again, we're going to follow up with how those admin tools show up over in uh, the global mapper side of the operation. And we're going to be taking a look at uh, your basic user preferences. Uh, there's a, a mixture of, of settings that we're going to take a look at that are found in the administrative menus and the general user preferences uh, for tying these two applications into a, a really a seamless uh, geodetics, uh, very high uh, accuracy and high resolution, uh, high precision geodetics toolbox uh, for all of the, the basic calculation type work on the calculator side, the administrative control and so on, and then the, the actual desktop GIS type workflow over on the global mapper side. Um, so we're going to be starting out uh, right in the calculator today. And uh, what, what I'm going to start off with is just a very simple example of how to set up uh, a single uh, a coordinate transformation uh, in the calculator uh, just so we can see some of the nuts and bolts that we're going to be controlling through the use of the admin tools today. Uh, so if you're, if you're new to the calculator, uh, the, the general layout of the tool is on the left hand side of the screen. We have the project manager. This is where we uh, lay out all of the individual conversion tasks and you'll see on mine I have a series of the, the first group here uh, under the folder called project. This is our default uh, collection of jobs, uh, basically just blank starting places to, to begin working. And then underneath that, I have a customized series of individual conversion tasks uh, that are uh, different combinations of settings from all of those, those first eight uh, types of jobs in the application. So the project manager is going to be where we organize a lot of the actual work we do in the calculator on the, the production side. We're going to be digging a little bit deeper under the hood. We're going to be taking a look in the options menu uh, up at the very top, uh, specifically in the, uh, the user preferences and the administrative settings. Uh, first, just as um, sort of by way of uh, introduction here for folks that are coming over from the global mapper side, uh, I'm going to set up just one very simple conversion here so we can see some of the, the basic dialogues uh, that are going to be uh, bubbling up over in uh, global mapper once we've connected the two applications and, and brought them together. Um, so again, we're going to see the global mapper side in a week with uh, the next presentation that's going to be by David McKittrick. Um, here on on the interactive conversions in the, the geographic calculator, and today I happen to be working in the 64-bit version of the application uh, on the 2014 release. Um, all of the stuff we're going to do today is going to be able to be done in 64-bit as well as 32-bit in both applications. So that's 32-bit and 64 calculator as well as global mapper. Um, we're going to start out here on the interactive conversions job, and this, this is essentially our default job. Uh, it's the first thing you see as a user when you fire up uh, the geographic calculator uh, for the very first time. Uh, in the project manager over on the, the top left there, you'll see it's uh, represented by this interactive conversions item in the, the very top project there. And normally this starts up as a, a blank uh, job with no coordinates entered, uh, the coordinate systems simply set to their defaults of WGS84. Uh, things like the defaults we're going to be taking a look at as we get into the preferences uh, and the admin tools because those are something that you can actually set controls for over on the global mapper side as well. Uh, where we're starting here is I've already entered a few uh, bits of data, I've already set a coordinate system, and I've already given it a coordinate uh, itself. So just for a, a very simple example here, we're going to be talking about a single latitude and longitude point. So I have a latitude of 44 degrees north, a longitude of negative 70 or 70 degrees west, and I've set those up in the coordinate system, a lat-long coordinate system or geographic coordinates of NAD27, the North American datum of 1927. It's our older uh, common survey model here in uh, North America. 
Uh, for setting this up, the only place that we would actually start one step ahead of this would be in setting the coordinate systems. So throughout uh, the calculator and as well on the global mapper side, once we've linked the two applications together, we're going to see some of these standard controls for making some of these selections. So. Uh, in, on the calculator side in particular, we do, we do this one way, in the global mapper side we're going to see we make our selections just a little bit differently. Um, but what we're going to do here is double click on our system box and uh, in the calculator side of things we're going to get a few different prompts and we're going to we're going to interact with these differently uh, in global mapper. So we are, we are going to see how some things are similar and how some things are different. On the calculator side, we have the ability to sort things out uh, by geography. Uh, we have some of the same tools over on the global mapper side. We have some optional prompts, and some of these things are going to be controlled by our user preferences, and some are going to be controlled by our admin tools. So in the calculator, the first prompt that comes up is, would we like to narrow down the list of coordinate systems by geographic area? Um, specifically, this is going to allow us to interact with a map, define where on the planet we're we're working uh, before it's going to narrow down those those lists of, of coordinate systems that we see. Uh, I'm actually going to skip past this right now and, and get into the whole library because this is a little bit more relevant uh, for those of you on the global mapper side. Um, so in our complete library, uh, what this is going to show us is an unfiltered view of everything in the database of coordinate systems. Uh, so one of the, the very common questions uh, folks uh, come up with when considering linking your, your two applications is why, why would I want to do this in the first place? Um, each application has their strengths. Um, the, the Global Mapper is a very comprehensive package around uh, file conversion, GIS analysis, terrain modeling, LIDAR processing, all of those very, very powerful functions. Um, and it is based on its own uh, coordinate system projection engine. Uh, it's been there for, for a long time, uh, since the core of the, the application was developed. Um, but it, it doesn't have as much stuff in it as the database on the calculator side. Um, there are you know, several hundred coordinate systems that you can use out of the box in, in Global Mapper, but by bringing in the calculator, we open that up to having more than 5,000 different coordinate systems, uh, more than 500 horizontal datums, uh, things like vertical datums, uh, geoid support uh, for doing three-dimensional transformations, and just simply a host of parameters that are available in the calculator that aren't available in uh, Global Mapper out of the box. So what we're going to do here is bring together uh, the, the high-powered geodetics engine of the geographic calculator, and we're going to link that up to the high-powered analysis and mapping functionality that we have in Global Mapper. So in uh, the, the, the geographic calculator side of things, this dialog that we're looking at now, the Select Coordinate System from Database dialog, this is uh, a dialog that you will directly see in Global Mapper once we've linked those two together. So you have access instantly to all of the, the host of coordinate systems and transformations and various parameters uh, that, are, that are available. Uh, since I already had a coordinate system set, it's going to open me up to that particular location in the database. And what we'll see is uh, I'm working down under the geodetic category of coordinate systems, so geographic coordinates, lat long, a few other names for those same types of things. Uh, we'll also see projected coordinates, uh, string-based uh, coordinates that are formatted values for, for different specialized grids, things like military grids or survey grid systems, uh, various other purposes in there. These are all organized uh, geopolitically. Uh, so with 5,000 coordinate systems in the database, we really do need a little bit more organization than just the simple drop-down lists that uh, you, you may be used to in the off-the-shelf uh, global mapper the database. Um, so these are nested uh, in subfolders, uh, first by uh, continent or uh, some special categories like time-based coordinates, uh, and then by smaller political subunits or geographical subunits. Um, such as either countries or major islands that, that make up a, a regional area. 
Uh, so I'm down under North America, that's where our NAD27 coordinate system is found. Uh, you'll see various information uh, available about that particular coordinate system. Things like uh, what type of units it deals with, uh, the datum that it's based on, uh, the area of use uh, for that system, uh, how many dimensions that coordinate system is intended to be used with, whether it's uh, two or three, uh, and things like EPSG codes. Uh, there's more information available to each of these, and we can access that simply by selecting the system and hitting the Info button, or we can right-click on that and say View Info. Uh, on the information panels, these are also going to be available over in Global Mapper uh, once these are linked together, so we can explore all of the same data for all of these, these systems. Uh, the information panels have uh, two tabs to them each. One is identification, this is for uh, basically cross-reference information, and the definition panel where we actually have all of the explicit parameters of things like a coordinate system uh, or a transformation or units or so on. Um, every single piece of the geodetic definitions is exposed uh, through these dialogues without needing to cross-reference any other documents. So if we want to see exactly where the area of use of this coordinate system is, we can open the information of that. Uh, we'll have a full text readout of where that is, is used, and we'll see both a bounding box as well as a polygon map of where that coordinate system is used on the planet. Uh, so there's nothing invisible uh, that goes on uh, in, in terms of the, the geodetic uh, parameters that are being used in here. On the identification panel, what we have are lists of uh, identifiers, and what these identifiers are uh, are ways to cross-reference these definitions against other databases or other software uh, that, that has a similar definition. So you'll see everything in here from uh, these CS codes in particular are uh, correlating to uh, CS map uh, as an engine, EPSG codes, ER mapper software, some of those, those older codes uh, that, that were used in uh, uh, the ER mapper software, uh, PRJ codes that you might find uh, when working with Esri software, SRIDs from Oracle databases, and, and so on. Uh, we might have multiples of each of those, and so you'll see some of these have, uh, for instance here we've got CS and then CS2. So there might actually be two codes that, that cross-reference into a, a given uh, database. But all of those when you see those those identifiers listed and the, the code that cross-references that to somebody else's database, that means we've matched that up, we've verified that all of the same parameters are at use, and you can be sure that the parameters in this software are matching what you're using somewhere else. So those are the, the basic definitions uh, that we have to work with. Once we select a, a given coordinate system, we can do any types of the, the conversions on it. Uh, if, we, if we can't find a particular coordinate system that we need, and we need to work with customized parameters, we can do that as well. You'll notice uh, in all of the, the lists of, of coordinate systems and other parameters, as you're moving around in here, you're going to notice that most of the definitions have a padlock uh, icon displayed with them. And that padlock icon uh, denotes that those are coming from our stock database, the off-the-shelf database database that has those 5,000 systems in it, and all of those definitions are protected. So you can't actually uh, modify the, those parameters in that definition itself. You're free to make copies of these, you're free to add in any number of custom parameters that you wish, but all of those named uh, stock definitions can't be harmed. And that gets particularly useful when you're collaborating with folks on, say, something like a network license, where you're all sharing a common database of coordinate systems. That's designed uh, to help users maintain those, those names and all the parameters that are behind them as standardized definitions. So again, all of these, these dialogues are going to show up over on the Global Mapper side uh, for working with coordinate systems, datums, transformations, and, and so on. Uh, at the bottom of this dialog, you'll see there's a very simple search tool. Uh, all you have to do is enter in uh, your, your search parameters, uh, and that can be things like either the name of the system, uh, the, the datum that's used in the system, EPSG codes, and so on. So you can very quickly browse down uh, through, if you don't exactly know where, where something is used, you can very quickly search that out to see what's available in the database. Um, so I'm going to simply select my, my NAD27 coordinate there and come back to the main screen. 
Now, one of the, the very powerful things that linking the two applications um, uh, brings together is the ability to dynamically and interactively select the transformation parameters that are used when going from one system to another. So we're going to set up a quick transformation here, and then we're going to take a look actually at the admin tools uh, and the preferences that make that link possible uh, between the two applications. So on the, on the main screen here, we've got our input system of NAD27, we have our output system of WGS84, and we've defined the point that we're looking to convert. Uh, in the case of dealing with, with vector data or raster data, uh, the data itself defines where on the planet we're working. Um, so for this, this job, we're looking at just one single point. It's a little bit simpler. We'll see this in context uh, of vector and, and raster data uh, next week as we get into the, the global mapper session. So to select a, a coordinate transformation, here on the, on the calculator side, uh, we have this coordinate transformation box in the middle. So we define where we're working, or the data that we're working with, the coordinate system for input and output, and then we simply double click to activate the coordinate transformation selector. Now this dialog as well is going to be available over on the Global Mapper side for interactively selecting these transformations. We are going to see uh, a nuanced way of doing this. There, is a, there are two settings that we can apply over on the Global Mapper side for either auto selection of a datum transformation or manual selection of the datum transformation. Uh, right now what we're going to take a look at is more akin to the manual uh, uh, selection of those datums. So you'll see there's a, a world map that's going to uh, display. Uh, when we take a look at all of the possible ways to connect those two datums, so to get from NAD27 to WGS84, you'll see we're returning four different ways to do that. Uh, now on the global mapper side of things, out of the box, when you pick a particular datum, it comes with one set uh, transformation value linking that datum to WGS84. You'll notice some of the parameters that I have here actually stop on other parameters in the middle. So I can go from NAD27 to NAD83, and then NAD83 to WGS84. So I can actually bring uh, two sets together, and sometimes that is a, a good way of getting a more accurate transformation overall than using a low accuracy direct transformation. We're, and we're actually seeing a good example of that right here, where we have our NAD27 to WGS84 parameters. The direct shift is only listed as accuracy of 5 meters, but we do a little better than that when we stop off on another horizontal datum in between. So uh, the dynamic nature of picking the, the combination of systems and the transformations is one of the main strengths of linking these two applications together. The calculator is very good at uh, helping a user make a, a very high accuracy decision about which transformations to use uh, and increasing the number of systems that we can connect in between. So the transformations themselves. We see a list here of four possible ways of linking these two systems together. Now, if we click on any of these transformations, those transforms are all intended to be used in a particular area of the planet. And so we have both the, the systems that we're, we're connecting up uh, that's going to give us one combination of, of ways to get through there. And then we can actually focus that down based on the, the region uh, that we're uh, interested in on a much more fine-tuned level. So we have uh, some of these transformations. As we click on, on each of those, we'll see uh, this, this first one that I've grabbed onto is intended to be used anywhere within the lower 48 states of the US. Uh, if I click on the next one down, that particular transformation is intended to be used specifically here in, in the region of the state of Maine. Uh, if we click on... Um, some of the others, they're you know, back out at the whole US, a uh, different part of New England, a nearby part of New England. Um, but I've still got these four to choose from. So we have all of these, these tools from defining the exact polygon area of where that transformation is intended to be used, as well as things like the accuracy of the transformation that we can use for cases where we've actually got overlap. So there might actually be several transformations that apply to the area such as we're, we're looking at here. Now, um, this is this is the the main thing that uh, that we're after is this this powerful selection of the best way to transform data from one system to another from the the most number of possible systems. So 
what we have here is uh, our tools for assessing the accuracy of the transformation. Uh, the accuracy is uh, something that is reported with a transformation. So within, say, uh, the accuracy is essentially saying within the bounds of this, this area that the transformation is intended to be used in, you are expected to maintain this level of accuracy when, when selecting these, these transformations. So for our first one here, since there are two transforms, we're going from NAD27 to NAD83, that transformation is accurate to about 15 centimeters, and the secondary transformation is accurate to about 4 meters. The second one here for the, the area of main specifically, that same set of parameters uh, to start from NAD27 to NAD83, and then a 1 meter accurate uh, transformation for the, the second step. So uh, theoretically our, our second option here would be more accurate than the first option. So through locating your data on the map, uh, assessing things like the accuracy uh, of the data within that area uh, and cross-referencing those parameters against other databases, other standards, or uh, internal business rules you might have. We use all these tools to help us make the best selection for how we're going to be manipulating this data. So for this case, I would probably grab on to my, my second transformation here, just simply because it has the lowest overall uh, accuracy rating, uh, or rather the highest accuracy rating through having the, the, the smallest uh, error. The, those accuracy statements are essentially the, the effective error for those transformations. So my, my second group of options here would have the highest overall accuracy for this localized area of my data. So I simply select that. It returns us back to our, our main job. And then in the calculator, whatever type of data we're dealing with, we would go ahead and hit the calculate button and finish off our work. What we'll be seeing next week is how that is done over on the global mapper side. It's a very different context since we're working with reprojection on the fly in the context of a, a larger map. So what we're going to be taking a look at today are some of those nuts and bolts of how we use these tools uh, on the calculator side to set up all the administration of that database for use over in uh, the either, actually either here in the calculator or in Global Mapper. So we're going to take a look down under uh, the administrative settings first. We're going to we're going to take a look at some of the various admin controls uh, that we can that we can put in place, and then we're going to take a look at the user preferences for how we actually set these things up and prepare the two applications to be linked together. So first, we're going to hop into the admin settings, and so again, options, uh, administrative tools is how you get there. Uh, and this particular uh, set of tools uh, has, has two chunks. Uh, much, much like the uh, information panels, there are two different sets of things we can take a look at and control here in the admin tools. So first, it starts us out on the filtering tab. And this is how we uh, streamline or restrict uh, an individual user's interaction with that database of coordinate systems and some of the, uh, the tools that are either enabled or disabled to help make some of those choices for what coordinate systems are available. So we've talked a little bit about how transformations uh, know exactly where on the planet they are applicable. Uh, coordinate systems also know where on the, the planet they are applicable. And we're going to take a look at how we filter some of those things out. So the first thing we're going to take a look at are those spatial filters. So at the very top here, the Edit Custom Areas of Use dialog uh, is going to open up a, a new dialog with a map control on it. And let's just maximize that so we can uh, we can get a little better view of what we're what we're seeing here. So this. Uh, uh, is included out of the box. Some of these are, are predefined, uh, so when you fire up the calculator for the first time, these are actually some of these are going to be active. Others of these areas are simply placeholders that you can take advantage of, and we've included some common areas, mostly by, by user request for popular coordinate system areas. I'm going to take a look at one of the out-of-the-box filters here as a, a means of customizing this. So particularly here in the United States, we have a number of ways to make some certain datum transformations. And so what, uh, what I'm going to do here is select the area of use that we've defined around the lower 48 states uh, of the continental US. So we'll 
when I click that, you'll see the, that area is just simply going to flash. And then over here on the lower right, uh, it's going to uh, bring up what what you've selected and if you you know there's a there's a little selection aperture there so if you're too close to a border it might select two different things that you can choose from uh, in this case I'm just hitting one area if you select that area in the list it will flash the the shape that that you're looking at I'm just gonna right click on that and we'll take a look at editing the area of use properties for that so there's a, a little uh, sub dialog uh, that, that comes up here. Uh, we can name any of those those areas of use, um, and I'm going to clarify this by saying these are the out of the box ones. Everything that we're going to take a look at here, you can actually do yourself. Uh, so you can add your own uh, layers on top of this to pull polygons from, or you can actually simply hand digitize around given areas to uh, customize those filters. Uh, there are uh, priority levels. Uh, if you happen to have uh, overlapping uh, areas of use, a priority level is set to allow one to take precedence over the other in case there's any uh, conflicting filtering. And that's very common along areas where you have uh, international borders uh, and there might be overlapping uh, national transformations on each side of the border. That's a, a very common uh, thing here in, in North America. Uh, on, on the US side of the border, we have a national transformation, and it actually spreads just a little bit north uh, of, the, of the border with Canada. Uh, likewise, in Canada, there's a national transformation that is actually valid just a little bit south of that border. Uh, users on one side of the border or the other might want uh, a single transformation to take precedence in those very nearby border regions. So that's why we might set a, a priority. Uh, and then there's the filters themselves. So I'm going to click on set up filters here and this is going to open up uh, the filtering dialog that looks very much like the dialog that we see when we go to make these selections. So it's essentially the same dialog. There's just a few extra controls on here that is uh, going to allow us to take a look at what is either shown or hidden uh, for uh, the area that we're working on. So under uh, single transformations here, I'm going to take a look down under our datum transformations list and we're just going to take a look at everything. You'll see this is categorized uh, by transformations uh, geographically, um, so by continent, uh, subregion, and such. Um, what I've done is selected the entire list here so we can see uh, everything uh, in, in the database. So there's about 1,800 to 2,000 different transformations available. Um, we can see the uh, the names of those, we can see the accuracies, the areas of use, where these are in, intended to be used. So there's two levels here. There is the predefined area of use uh, that we have for the, all of those, those individual transformations. Uh, and then there's the custom areas of use that we're going to be adding on top of that. So what I'm going to do is select all of our, our datum transformations and I'm going to uh, search out just those covering uh, NAD27. So I'm going to do a very simple text search at the bottom um, and you'll notice actually on screen I've got a, a couple of uh, custom objects uh, that, are, that are coming up that are unfolded. Um, those are left over from the uh, last training course we did I believe. So I'm just going to do a quick search there for all of our NAD27 systems and it's going to narrow down that list to all of the ways we can connect NAD27 to other datums. So most of these are WGS84. We'll see a few of these are going to be going to things like NAD83 or the, the Canadian realization of NAD83 as well. Now how this list is different uh, from other lists is that it has this checkbox at the very beginning uh, of the list and you'll also notice there is this little red exclamation point. Uh, I'm going to talk about both of those. Uh, the very first column there, that checkbox column, you'll notice only a few of these things are enabled uh, within these regions. Um, most of these are disabled and if you'll if you'll notice some of these are for different regions so some of them are for areas of the Caribbean um, let's see here we've got one for the Bahamas uh, the continental US uh, various parts of Canada getting down into uh, Central America as well NAD 27 is a continent-wide coordinate system but as we can see on our map in the background there we're only focused on a smaller subregion 
of that larger possibility of use for these, these transformations. So what this dialog allows us to do in the, the area of use filters is we can actually manually override whether or not certain options appear to us when we're making these selections. So within the area of the continental US, uh, out of the box, we use some of these custom filters. So we shut off essentially everything that is not uh, the national transformation that is approved for survey use here in the States. They could be uh, turned back on by a user at any time. You just come back in here if there's a particular set of parameters that, uh, that you need to work with. The reason we filter those out is because some of those other parameters are actually lower accuracy methods. And you'll, you'll take a look at the, the accuracy tags. You'll see some of these are very, very uh, loose accuracy. And so as a preventative measure, we hide some of those and leave only those that are uh, the official methods uh, respected for, uh, from survey authorities uh, within that, that particular area. So filters are all about narrowing down some of those choices. The other thing you're going to notice are some of these options that are listed in red. Um, you'll see the, the text of the, the names and such are going to be in red, and there's also going to be this red exclamation point uh, at the beginning uh, of, the, of the entry there. What that indicates is that that particular transformation is uh, not ready to be used. Uh, most of the time what that means is that transformation is dependent upon having a certain set of uh, data files on your local machine. Um, so the examples that I, I have right here at the top, I can see by, by area of use, those are all uh, depending on uh, some, some grid tables, uh, specifically this uh, Canadian NTV2 method. Um, and those are grid tables that we're uh, simply not... Um, allowed to distribute out of the box uh, with the calculator. They are a standardized method. You can get those grid tables. You just have to do so directly from the local authorities uh, in, in those regions. Some of these we do have access to. And so when you see some of these objects that you're trying to use, uh, either in calculator or you'll see the same thing over in Global Mapper, if you simply right click on those, there will be an option to download the missing files. When you say download the missing files, that reaches out to our FTP site, automatically grabs the, the necessary grid files, copies them to your local machine, and then they'll be instantly available for use as soon as that download completes. Um, so that's what the, the red fonts are, are going to be about in there. So these are our spatial filters. Uh, the spatial filters can be applied, again, to, uh, let's just pack up the list here, we'll see what those can be applied to, either coordinate systems or simply transformations. Uh, so everything from a datum transformation to a uh, geodetic coordinate system, projected coordinate system, whatever type of, of system you're dealing with in there. Um, so all of those uh, can be added onto out of the box uh, in addition to those that we have uh, that, that we're seeing on screen here. So I'm just going to cancel out of this dialog because I haven't actually changed anything. And I'm just going to point out where you, you go to add your own in here uh, as well. You'll see there's a, a, a tool at the very top uh, of the, the toolbar there. It's a little polygon. You can use that to manually draw your own uh, polygons on screen. Uh, or as well, you can also use the file menu to import your own polygon data. Um, so if you have these stored as something like a, you know, a shape file, an AutoCAD file, a map info tab file, any of the supported vectors formats. Uh, you can import those directly uh, and add those on, or you can completely replace those, those out of the box uh, and uh, areas of use uh, that, that we ship with the calculator. All of these, these areas of use uh, with the, the extra filters that are applied to those, these are going to uh, streamline the user's interaction both here in the calculator as well as in Global Mapper. So all of these settings will be inherited by Global Mapper when it is using uh, the calculator's geodetics engine to do its work. So I'm just going to close out of the, the custom areas of use uh, filtering, and we're going to take a look at the, the simple filtering. And these are simply on or off switches that are not spatially dependent. Um, so it's the second button on our admin settings here, the set data view, source view and filters button. When we access that list, it's going to bring up a very similar dialog uh, to the, what we were just looking at, except here you're going to actually see 
everything that is a geodetic parameter in the database. So everything from angular units, uh, linear units, all of the various types of transformations, the areas of use themselves, and this, this can be used to fine-tune absolutely anything in the database of geodetic parameters. So a very a common example I, I use a lot here is down under the angular units. Um, so in the, the database, out of the box, we have a dozen different types of uh, ways to specify our angles. Now, for myself as a user, I rarely use anything other than degrees, and every once in a while, maybe I'll use a radian for, for a particular operation. But most of the time, I work with just straight up simple degrees. So when I'm interacting with different parts of the, the interface, just to speed things up for myself, I actually hide all of the other units just so I have less things to try and read down through and find what I'm looking for. So this can be applied to any of those other types, from the datums to whole coordinate systems or just individual transformations. So how this works is I, I would typically start for, for this purpose. If I only want to see one thing, I'm going to use the buttons beneath that list to hide all of those objects. And you'll just simply see that remove the, the checkbox uh, from the, the show field in there. And then what I would do is go back in there and turn on uh, the, the two different uh, types of, of degrees that there are. And uh, a lot of folks ask why there are two in there. Uh, essentially, it comes down to the EPSG database standards. It's essentially an academic difference uh, between those two that uh, doesn't, doesn't really matter for, for most of us uh, sort of more normal folks uh, working, with, uh, working with these data points. So I'm going to filter this down to just those two uh, to choose from. And I'm actually going to go ahead and save that filter. And that filter filter gets saved into my workspace settings. Um, so it's just verifying that we're going to save that. I'm going to go ahead and say yes. Then as we are moving around in the, the main interface out here, I'm actually going to close all the way out of the admin settings. As I go to select our, our different types of angle units, we just double click on that. And instead of seeing all of those uh, dozen different ways to specify an angle, I just see the two that I have approved uh, for myself. Or if I'm sharing this with other folks, if I'm the administrator of the application, I can set filters that will apply to everybody that's using it. So those filter tools, again, I'm just going to pop back in there and take a look at the filters. Those filter tools can be applied to any of the different types of uh, geodetic parameters uh, that we have. So whether it's a, a coordinate system, a vertical datum, anything in there, we can simply turn on or off. Uh, and then the user never sees it um, as, as an option. If you are an admin user, you can turn them on and off at will, uh, or as an admin, you can impose those uh, restrictions or streamlining, however you want to look at those, you can impose those on uh, your users. And all kinds of reasons you might do that. One would be to keep folks out of trouble from, from making bad selections, and the other is simply to make it easier to find what you intend them to be working with uh, throughout your applications. So those are our filters. Uh, there are all kinds of sub-specialty settings in here uh, that we can use to turn off and on certain types of the filtering. Uh, so down at the bottom, we'll see the area of use uh, settings. And there are various things that we can choose to ignore, some of that extra help that we can choose to ignore. So we can uh, choose to ignore the custom areas of use. These, these are typically toggled on. Um, toggled on or off by admin level users who uh, simply need to override some things to work outside of those areas of use if, uh, if they need. So out of the box, this is actually what the settings look like. You'll notice we have one setting in place to ignore uh, the, the data source areas of use. We, we actually set this to ignore the coordinate system envelopes when we're making those selections. Uh, that can be... Uh, turned off. Uh, so it, it is an ignore setting. So when we turn that off, it pays attention to the areas of use when selecting coordinate systems. And what that does is it takes into account the area of the data you're working with and filters down the list of appropriate coordinate systems to take that out to. Uh, so it reduces the overall um, 
group of uh, group of settings that you're going to see when you're choosing your output coordinate systems. Uh, with those, what uh, uh, what takes place? The reason we turn that off uh, out of the box is because some of those areas of use uh, they're defined by the EPSG database. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's a good resource to take a look at. Uh, it's EPSG-registry.org. Uh, the areas of use are all defined by the EPSG, uh, and some of them for for practical applications are a little bit tight for the average user. Uh, for instance, if you're getting near the edge of a coordinate system, or if you have a, a project that spans two coordinate system zones, um, say take a common UTM zone, uh, if your project spans the border of either of those uh, and you have that filtering turned on for the coordinate systems, it might falsely exclude something that you really do actually need to be working with. Out of the box, we, we have that set to ignore just to make it a little bit more flexible and uh, that can be toggled on at any time. Sorry for those those pop-ups. It looks like my, my laptop is trying to mess with my color scheme here on, on the session. Uh, if that keeps popping up, I'm just going to keep on, on closing it. Um, and then let's move on to the, the administrative uh, settings. So on the administrative uh, tab of the administrative settings, here are various things that a, a true admin user uh, might use mostly within the context of administering uh, a group of users that is, uh, is going to be working with the GeoCalc tools either here in Calculator or both in Calculator and Global Mapper. So these are various things like uh, locking certain settings, like locking which data source you're getting all of those parameters from, whether or not your end user is able to manipulate that data source, um, how uh, essentially how much they are able to customize the parameters that they're dealing with. Down at the bottom, there are various locks on things like overriding spatial database connections, uh, whether or not a user is allowed to use a null transformation in, in some cases, and some, some very uh, specific settings about controlling the fine tuning of these, these various geodetic operations we can, we can maintain. All of this is able to be password protected. You'll see that right at the top there. So if, if you wish to actually really restrict your users from being able to make some of these changes, you set these options in place, set a password for that workspace, um, and then either here in Calculator or over in Global Mapper, they're not going to be able to mess with the, the geodetic database that you have laid down for them to, to use as, as the approved database. Um, the administrative settings, that's that's pretty much all we wanted to talk about here for the admin settings. I'm just going to follow this up by uh, going over to the user preferences. There are some ramifications here uh, when connecting to applications. There are some practicalities that you may run into. I'm just going to talk about uh, simply saving those files, uh, where we're going to store things, how we connect these two applications. Uh, and then we're going to wrap it up for today, follow up with actually working within these, these confines uh, next week in the global mapper session. Specifically, when we are setting up these uh, these applications, um, these can be used to connect the, the two applications together, either 32 or 64-bit. Um, and th uh, the workspaces themselves from Calculator, the default workspace in the Calculator, is where all of the settings are going to be obtained by Global Mapper. So I just want to take a, a quick look here uh, at some of the general settings uh, that we'll see for our defaults, as well as the file locations, how we actually save these, these various workspaces and such in each of the applications. So first here on the general tab, the, the one uh, settings uh, I would like to point out are the default horizontal coordinate systems and the default vertical coordinate systems. You'll see these two blue boxes at the top of the application, or the top of the dialog rather. Those allow us to set a default coordinate system. Uh, the default vertical is set to none. Um, that A lot of users do leave that set to none, but if you do purely work in 3D coordinates, you may be interested in setting a default uh, vertical system there as well. Um, the horizontal coordinate system is defaulted to WGS84. That's fairly standard through most uh, spatial applications, but uh, if you are working in a, a specific region and you tend to work in one more 
a more specific localized coordinate system, you can simply double click on that uh, setting and find whatever uh, default coordinate system you wish uh, to see. That will uh, uh, bubble up here in the calculator as well as over in Global Mapper. Um, Lastly, I just want to talk about the file locations. Uh, the file locations are a little bit key to linking these two tools together. Um, namely the workspace file, uh, the default workspace that we see in the application. Uh, if you're looking at your own tools, you're going to see that I have a different workspace uh, set as my default uh, than, than the normal one. Um, you can move to a custom uh, workspace. You can change the location of that. These can be put out on network resources if you're trying to share these uh, between different users. Um, it doesn't matter where that is saved, but the important thing to note when connecting the two tools together is that Global Mapper is going to pay attention to the settings that are stored in your default workspace. So that's this very top field here on the File Locations tab. Um, that, uh, that workspace is also going to store these data source files. So the main data source and the custom data source, those are the two databases where all of your geodetic parameters get stored. So um, the, the paths that are in there come from that default workspace. Those need to be accessible by every uh, user that you are uh, hoping to have use uh, the, the tandem geographic calculator with Global Mapper accessing the libraries. Um, if if that is a, a network resource, that's that's fine. Um, it can be a local resource as well. The only thing is Global Mapper also needs to be able to see to whatever that location is. That is really the, the main backbone of linking those two together. Um, I mentioned, uh, I actually see some questions coming in uh, uh, clarifying some of these. Um, I, I mentioned that this works with either version of either application. So we have uh, Geographic Calculator 64-bit and 32-bit. We have Global Mapper 64-bit and 32-bit. When you are using mixed versions. So let's let's just take for example, I'm working here in Geographic Calculator 64-bit. Say for example you were working in Global Mapper 32-bit for whatever reason, or the other way around. Maybe you're working in Geographic Calculator 32-bit and Global Mapper 64-bit. Uh, that is entirely possible. It still keys into those default workspace locations. Um, the, the general hierarchy here is if you have uh, both versions of either application installed, uh, Global Mapper will try to take a look at the 32-bit uh, uh, application's default workspace. Uh, if you only have the 64-bit version installed, it will then look at that. But uh, generally, for, for best practices, how we recommend to, to to set this up is if you have both 32 and 64 of each application, what you want to do is set the default workspace on the calculator side specifically, you want to set that default workspace to the same file location. So each application uses that same default set of workspaces. What that does is it allows both of your calculator uh, installations to share those settings without any uh, confusion of the, of the filtering and uh, allows uh, Global Mapper to easily get the same, the same sets that you are used to working with in both of your calculator tools. On the Global Mapper side, it simply automatically looks at that workspace location. Uh, it does not uh, need to be uh, controlled. Uh, so if you have Global Mapper 32 and Global Mapper 64, uh, it will, uh, both of those will look at the same uh, default workspace. Uh, if you have, I, I know we're, we're talking about a lot of different versions, a lot of combinations of different stuff here. If you are looking to set this up and you, you have any questions about the, the fine tuning of, of uh, multiple versions, please feel free to contact our tech support team. Um, you can uh, either uh, uh, reach us uh, via email or on the Global Mapper user forum. Uh, the email address again is geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com. And you can also uh, get to us. We do monitor uh, globalmapperforum.com uh, as well for, for tech support. Um, so two, two very easy ways to uh, get a little more clarity on, on the, the custom nature of your own set. Um, I mentioned that those can both also be put out on network locations. That's also entirely fine. Uh, and it works, uh, works just the same uh, in Global Mapper. Uh, Global Mapper will simply depend on whatever this default workspace is on uh, the calculator side. Um, 
that's pretty much going to wrap it up uh, for uh, for what we're talking about today. Uh, what I'm going to do now is take a look at uh, any of the, uh, the the questions that have come in. Um, and uh, then we're going to uh, again follow up uh, next week uh, with the global mapper side of this. Um, so let's see, there's a, a question in on uh, if you've got a, a local geoid, um, how can you add it? Uh, uh, and then which extension? Um, the extension part, uh, I'm uh, I'm going to have to field that as best I can. There are a number of different extensions uh, for, for working with geoids. Uh, one of the things the calculator does is it enables vertical datum transformations. Um, it, it's simply a core part of the geographic calculator, always has been, uh, but it enables vertical datum transformations over in Global Mapper. So if you're working with you know, uh, very high precision three-dimensional data, things like LIDAR, or terrain models and such, we can now actually transform between ellipsoid heights and geoids, between various geoids, uh, various uh, tidal models as well that are that are supported here in Calculator. Uh, to define your own geoid, down under the data source menu, you'll see there is a, a group uh, for coordinate system definitions. Uh, under coordinate system definitions, there are various categories here. So uh, fitted systems are engineering uh, systems. We actually don't use those over in Global Mapper. Uh, geocentric systems as well are not used in Global Mapper. Those are 3D Cartesian systems, uh, Earth-centered, Earth-fixed. Uh, primarily what you're going to see in Global Mapper are geodetic, uh, projected, and vertical uh, coordinate systems. So if you're, if you're looking to add your own uh, geoid model, there's a couple of things you're going to have to add. Uh, first, uh, you're going to need to add a vertical datum, and I'm just going to back out one step here and show you where that is. You're going to need to add, uh, under datum definitions, you'll see that you'll need to add a vertical datum, and that's essentially just a name uh, of the, the vertical datum that you're going on. A vertical datum doesn't actually have any of its own parameters. You're going to need to then go under the coordinate system settings, uh, co excuse me, coordinate system definitions dialog of the data source menu. Uh, under there, you'll get into the vertical coordinate systems. I'm just going to hit all, and you'll see all the ones we have out of the box in here. Uh, this is uh, going the, the vertical datum, uh, uh, excuse me, the vertical coordinate system is going to need the name of the vertical datum that you're using. Uh, also, doesn't doesn't have any parameters. Um, Let's, uh, let's just go ahead and crack one open here. I'll open up, uh, let's see here, I'll open up EGM 2008. Um, so the, the vertical coordinate system essentially calls the vertical datum that you've created. It defines where on the planet it's used. And the main thing is it has a point style. Uh, the point style is simply a either height or depth uh, for a vertical system, as well as the linear units that you're using to specify those. The real meat of adding the geoid, you do need the vertical datum and the vertical coordinates system to select those geoids. Um, the real meat of uh, the geoid is the transformation itself. So under coordinate transformation definitions on the data source menu, you'll see uh, concatenated transformations and single transformations. Concatenated is simply a group of multi-step transformations. Single transformations is what you're going to want for most of your geoids. Uh, single transformation is simply a one-step uh, setting on the geoid. So down under vertical, you'll see single transformations. Underneath uh, that, you'll see vertical. Um, all of these are either uh, local offsets uh, or actual geoid models. Now, if you're going to be creating your own uh, geoid model. Uh, this can get a little tricky. I'm going to show you um, how to, to go about adding something if it's in a standardized uh, format. Uh, you'll, you'll come into the transformations here. You'll click this little plus button underneath the list to create a new definition. Um, uh, to create a new definition, that's going to pop up uh, your the dialog where you can give it a name, uh, state its accuracy, and things like that. On the definition, you'll see there are various methods uh, that have they simply have the names of other geoids that are out there. Uh, geoids all come down to the grids that you've got. So you're, you were mentioning the extensions. Uh, it matters uh, less about the extension than it does about the structure of that geoid file you've got. So if the structure of that file matches something else that is out there, uh, and it's, it's very common to have some of these 
uh, these standardized types used by uh, a number of different countries might actually u all use the same model as something else. Uh, if it matches one of those standard types that we already support, so take for example the EGM96 model, um, all you have to do is specify the file um, uh, the, the particular file that it's going to get that grid data from. Uh, there are some that call one specific file, such as EGM96. Uh, there are others, such as the various United States geoid models, where the file itself is irrelevant and you specify the extension to look for a group of files in there. Um, so uh, one of the common ones here, I'm just bringing up US Geoid model of 96 because it is fairly common. A few countries uh, do use that same grid structure. If you've got a grid of that, that structure, you simply enter in uh, the extension uh, and the path uh, to that. The, the path uh, is pointing to a specific uh, folder in your installation. Um, You'll see it, uh, all of the other geoids will have that, that same path. It's pointing into a, a vertical locations folder um, to get those, those uh, group of geoid files. Uh, those will then enable the transformation to be selected from your source system to your output system. Um, there, there can be a, a little bit of nuance to doing this, so I would, uh, I would encourage you, if you're looking to put your own in here, I would definitely encourage you to uh, contact tech support and we'll, uh, we'll get you on the right track. We can help you make sure that the geoid does actually match one of those, uh, those uh, pre-existing standards. Um, because on, honestly, it, it is uh, one of the more complicated things uh, you, you can do in the application. Um, so I, I hope I answered your question there. And um, uh, we'll have to take that one offline. So if you want to follow up, uh, we can uh, hopefully get you on the right track with the uh, with uh, setting up your your custom geoids. Uh, um, another question coming in here. I'm going to take this one more question, and uh, and we're going to wrap it up. Um, the, uh, are the updates uh, in Geographic Calculator are those made in real time if you are using uh, Global Mapper concurrently? Um, the answer to that is no. Uh, when you're working in the Geographic Calculator, all of those updates they actually have to be saved uh, in place. You've got to save that workspace um, rather than having them instantly available. So. So if you're working in the geographic calculator, making some edits to those, those various filters, the various settings, um, once you save that workspace and then start up Global Mapper, you will see uh, all of those things like the filters, the admin tool restrictions, all of those will, will take place. If you have them working side by side live uh, and, and you make an update in the calculator, you do have to save and commit that and then restart uh, Global Mapper. Uh, since Global Mapper loads up the workspace, that workspace does need to be uh, committed before you will see those, those changes take effect over on the Global Mapper side. Um, so thanks for a, a couple of great questions there. Uh, if there are uh, some of the other questions uh, coming in that we didn't have time for, we'll follow up with those, uh, those after the fact. Um, if you do have any further questions between now and the next webinar, please feel free to, to set those up and uh, we, can, we can hopefully answer those uh, as, as we get rolling over on the Global Mapper side of, of this session. Um, just going to bring up our, our closing slide here. Talking about that next session, uh, it is going to be July 24th. That is uh, one week from uh, one week from today, same time. Uh, it's going to be hosted by uh, David McKittrick, one of our senior application specialists here at Blue Marble, a uh, colleague of mine. Uh, it is going to be focused purely on the Global Mapper side. So how all of these admin settings uh, appear uh, as we lay down all of these filters, set them in place, and then try and make use of them over on the Global Mapper side to both increase that accuracy, the precision, the number of options that we have for transformations, and really bring together these, these two very powerful applications. So thank you everyone for, uh, for attending today, and we will see you next time. Hello and welcome to the Geographic Calculator webinar for the month of July. Currently all attendees are in listening